Hi. <laughs> so um, some of you may know that three, four months ago, I started writing a series of um, articles or blogs or posts on food and style and travel and some of my observations on life and putting that on social media, um, Facebook, Instagram. And for the most part, it's, it's been very encouraging, the feedback. Um, there are other people who have had similar experiences and they'll kind of share that on the comments. Um, but then there's been kind of some criticism around my critiques or reviews and things as well. I've had um, a few restaurants threatened to sue. I've had um, other people that didn't get a favorable review um, that kind of wrote disparaging posts about me on social media. So that's, that's kind of the journey that I like to talk about today. Um, kind of before I go more into that, how did I get to this point? So um, for the last six years, I've been working in the sustainable development sector. For the last six years, like writing, things, writing about things like climate change, food security, non-communal diseases. And whilst that's kind of fulfilling on, on kind of one, one level, it, you know, ultimately some of the work that I do, it, it, it's part of kind of bigger work that a lot of other people do that ultimately benefits specific communities. So, so in that regard, it, it is extremely fulfilling although my work is really removed. I, I do a lot of work based on technical reports that are given to me. Uh, I very rarely go out into the field that these agencies um, kind of work in. Like, I, I don't actually get to meet the communities that these um, interventions and actions help. So there was, there was kind of a need within me to kind of have a creative outlet that was more direct, that was more personal, where I, could, I felt like I could express myself, and, and that's kind of how um, I started to write about the things I've been writing about. Um, and so kind of backtracking a bit more even before that, for about eight years I worked on the Air Pacific in-flight magazine at Islands Business under the late Lisa Tanga, who was a, a friend and a mentor, and I feel like I learned a lot from her. And that was a great gig, like every month I'd be out, and so I pretty much got to see almost all of Fiji, with the exception of Rotuma. And that's a place I'd kind of really love to go to for obvious reasons. It just looks really amazing and, you know, its own culture and language. And who doesn't want to go to Rotuma in the fire season, right? Um, yeah, but so through Air Pacific and Flight, I got to, you know, dive off Kandavu. I got to kind of experience what it might feel like to be a billionaire on Lalala Island. You know, that's a place where Oprah goes now almost on a yearly basis. And the Google founders were there recently. I've uh, backpacked in the Asawa, where else? Yeah, we've been sailing in the Laon Islands. So I've had these kind of amazing experiences, and all of that sort of culminated in my being appointed um, editor of the Fiji Airways in-flight magazine two, yeah, two years ago. And that was meant to be um, a, a kind of a two-year contract, but six months into it, I threw the towel in. Maybe I had already outgrown the job when I took it on. But a big part of my not staying on had to do with kind of production values. I, I trained globally. I went, went to school in Japan, and then I worked in Japan, and then in Europe. I worked in Milan, and then in France as well. So when I came back to live in Fiji 13 years ago, I you know, kind of tried to continue to produce work at a global standard. And there, and there is an international standard. If um, creatives are producing a certain type of work in, in France, it will hold up in New York, it'll hold up in you know, Milan, it'll hold up in other places, like in you know, Sydney and Auckland. Um, the unfortunate thing with Fiji, I think, is we've got this culture of near enough is good enough. And an excuse I often hear is, oh, you know, oh, this is Fiji, when, when, when things aren't. Yeah, I think any time you want to do work of a higher standard, it's, it's difficult in a place like this. It's, it's a smaller country, that the resources aren't there. And, and, you know, I think also the will to produce work of a higher standard or higher quality is in there as well. So that's something I kind of constantly come up against, and it's something I'm, you know, not too crazy about. Um, I, don't, I think it's a bit of a cop-out to use the excuse that, oh, because we live in a kind of tiny island nation, isolated from the rest of the world, therefore a lesser standard is okay, it's acceptable, it applies. I mean, increasingly, we're a part of the, the global world. The, the world comes to us, to our shores. We have to interact with an international audience. Um, 
Fijians go and live abroad, and if we took that sort of attitude to work elsewhere, it just wouldn't fly. We wouldn't make it. Um, so, so that's some of my sort of personal experience and criticism around trying to produce work of a higher standard. And that's something you sort of strive towards every single day. Um, I don't, personally don't make it. I mean, as a creative, you have this sort of perfectionist streak. You're always trying for better and better and better. And some days you think you kind of, you know, hit the mark. You like a line or a piece of writing or a photograph you might have produced. But um, for the most part, it's, you know, you, you constantly edit. Um, having said that, I'm not alone. I think there are other people, other creatives in Fiji that are making really beautiful work at an international standard. I think Kama Catch Me, the wedding photographers, they come to mind. I think they're doing really beautiful work. Um, when I worked on the, the new Fiji Airways in-flight magazine, at the same time for the same publisher, I worked on a, a, an edition of, of travel. And for that, I got to work with some really, really amazing Fijian creatives that were producing work that would hold up anywhere. Unfortunately, that didn't really, you know, like it just wasn't, <laughs> Not so much that it wasn't well received, it just didn't get circulated, distributed, or, or, or get the attention I felt that it deserved. Um, so, okay, how does that tie into everything else I've been going on about? <laughs> um, yeah, so there's that kind of a, our culture of, oh, this is Fiji, and oh, so that's somehow acceptable, and that sort of, you know, like, I, I think mediocrity, you kind of see across the board in a lot of other sectors and industries and stuff as well. It might be food standards, it might be service standards, it, you know, it, and, and, because I, I feel, feel like I'm constantly coming up against that. And a lot of my friends say, oh, you've got to lower your expectations if you live here. But how are we expected to grow as a nation, as a people, as a culture, if we're, const you know, if we're constantly accepting that less than or, or kind of, you know, is good enough, like we don't expect more. So that's, that's kind of one of the points I wanted to raise. Um, the other thing is um, criticism. I think there's a glaring lack of, of open, kind of independent criticism in, in kind of, well, I, I don't want to say in the mainstream press because my specific focus is lifestyle. So I'll, I'll look at lifestyle journalism. There's a kind of cozy relationship between the um, advertisers and then th the magazines. So the magazines will write sort of really nice things about the advertisers, the advertisers give them ads, and then the magazine sustains itself. But I think the readers really lose out. So a lot of the local magazines, they just they read like advertorials. And you know, no one ever says, oh, OK, this was great, but I thought this sucked, and this needs improvement. And, which is kind of what real life is like, and that's what I've tried to, you know, get across in, 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 in my writing. And I think for the most part, it has been appreciated, but for some of the people that maybe didn't get as nice reviews, they, they took it extremely personally. And that's where those other things like, you know, threats of getting sued and what have you have um, come up from. Um, so, uh, you know, if those of you that do it, my, my stuff, like, you know, the, you would know that I'll, I love to travel. And so I'm in, in January, I, I turned 40. And so for my 40th birthday, I um, did a big trip to, I went and saw my sister in England. And then I went to um, Italy to see friends there and also travel, travel a bit. And went to Sicily and saw some friends there. And, 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 and I loved Italy. I loved food and color and culture and the language. And from there, I went to Greece. I wasn't meant to go to Greece. I was meant to go to um, either Spain or France. But I reached out to a girlfriend that lives in Greece who I hadn't seen for a really long time, like 13 years, and said, oh, do you, know, you want to meet up in Paris and we can do Paris our haunts together? Because she and I used to live in Paris together. And she says, oh, you know, why don't you come to Greece? So that's how I kind of ended up in Greece. And I never made it to France because I absolutely fell in love with Greece. Everything, the people, the language, the culture, the islands, the food. Um, there's a real kind of a, a soul connection with the place. And, and I think that's what's really amazing about travel is, um, you know, certain people and places and, and experiences can, what can really make you feel, like feel stuff. So for me, I guess it's, it's even within this kind of lifestyle sector, which can be quite superficial and talk about, you know, buy this and have that and do that. It's, that's kind of never been enough. I, it's not enough for me to say, oh, I went there and I bought that and I ate this. What really interests me is, is um, it's kind of 
the sort of the, the deeper stuff, having immersive experiences, like really, even if it's for a little while, living like a local, um, you know, speaking to the people, getting kind of into their heads, kind of trying to understand how they live and why a place functions the way it does. Um, and, you know, seeing this friend of mine, this really, really dear friend of mine who I haven't seen, and I haven't seen a whole bunch of people for like 13 years, 13 years that I've been living back here. And, and some of it is just the distance. And um, I've been doing shorter trips, maybe Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, you know, Pacific Island countries, it's easier. And, and Europe, such a long haul, sort of a, you know, takes 40, almost 48 hours to get there and 48 hours back. So um, it, was, it was kind of very deeply emotional. These are people that knew me in my early 20s and kind of, I feel like, my formative years when we were at school together and, and working and growing and learning and all that sort of stuff. And, and I remember in 2003 when I decided to come back and live in Fiji, I felt like I had to shelve a certain part of me because I felt like it wouldn't be accepted here. Like I, I had piercings and I remember taking the piercings out and I think remember having a bit of a cry about that because I knew it's something that, you know, people wouldn't get. I mean, when I went, when I was at school in Mars, if you wore, if you wore gel in your hair, you were a fag, you know, like, so, and I think we've come a long way since then. I mean, everyone's embraced metrosexuality, but so 2003, I don't think it was still, you know, uh, uh, kind of a, a thing then. So, so I, I think, you know, we've, we've come a long way, but, but going back to this trip and seeing my friends and, and, and kind of spending that time there and it, um, it, it was kind of deeply healing and I felt like I, I, there was a kind of an integration happening of, of kind of my old self that I'd left behind and um, that I missed and then kind of the newer self, the, the me I am in Fiji and the things I do and, and, and there was kind of like a, a, a kind of a, a coming together of, of, these, of these different parts of me. And um, I reflected some of this in my writing. I was writing deeply personal things, and it was, it was kind of moving away from the stuff that I'd started with four months ago. Four months ago, I was writing about the best noodle shop in Suva, or um, was looking at old vintage Tiki Togs photographs and talking to the models in the photographs from what, 70s, 80s, and talking about the experiences around when it was shot, etc. So there's been a, there's been a bit of a bit of a, a journey as well in that. And I, I guess what I liked about that whole experience, and because it's free of commercial constraints, I don't have to make any money off of it, I can kind of follow my intuition and write about what I want to write, is that it evolves as I evolve. I, whatever I feel kind of inspired by at the moment, I write. And I know worldwide there's this big push for people, individuals, to, to brand themselves and create a brand. And a lot of branding is about consistency. It's like, oh, you know, this is what I stand for and, and repeating that over and over and over again. And personally, I just kind of find that really dull. Um, if anything, I just kind of like to be led by the heart. And, and I'm really fortunate that I get to do that in, um, in my creative space. But you know, you know, I have other work that sustains me day to day. Um, yeah, I just kind of want to close by saying that um, the, the sort of artists I admire are the ones that make sort of deeply autobiographical work. It's people like, you know, late Frida Kahlo. She did, she did, you know, really beautiful paintings and led quite a tortured existence, but, you know, really explored that in her work. I love people like um, the Carolyn author, Arundhati Roy, who's also, you know, alongside her literary work, she's also an activist. Um, and then there's someone like Lena Dunham, who did HBO's Girls. I don't know how many of you have seen that, but I love that show, and she's very representative of a moment in time. And I also think she's like very honest and, and really puts her kind of, um, how do I put this? There's a kind of globalized ideal of what you know, a woman's body should look like, what, if, you know, what, it, what an ideal is, and she, you know, completely goes against that grain, and, 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 and I love her for that. And then there's um, Ai Weiwei, the, the Chinese um, activist artist, who, um, you know, does, does art as, as political dissent, but that's hugely personal. So, so in Greece, I went um, to a museum where he had done a lot of work around refugees, and uh, that, that was deeply personal, but also deeply moving. 
And I guess in all of that, in all these like very different individuals creating creating personal work and personal art and, and exploring themselves and their experiences, there's a there's a kind of an unrelenting search for the truth. And and for me, that's what I'm kind of moving more and more towards. It's like you know discovering my own truth and, and seeing the beauty in that truth and, and writing about it and sharing it. Yep. Thank you.